Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us. My name is Pue, and I'm also just here on behalf of Habitat International Coalition. So just before we start, I would like to make a few house rules. Uh, please put on your masks like, throughout the, um, uh, the session. And then uh, just to also note to people that will have NADA and just one of our colleagues as well taking pictures for the event. But if you have any objections, please feel free just to indicate to us as well. Um, I'll hand over to my colleague, Nicola. Thank you. Thank you, CP. Uh, before introducing our event and our great panelists, uh, Linda Kohle and Goni, um, one of the leaders of the Abaklali movement, a mass democratic grassroots movement in South Africa, was supposed to be with us presenting the movement on this panel. Uh, however, it was brutally gunned down in his home on August 20th. Uh, we will now watch a short commemorative video. We used to talk a lot about death because we knew very well that someday luck won't be on our side. They will kill us. He even said uh, it's socialism or death. Because we want it. No matter what it takes. No matter what it takes. Even if it means death. Because we can't really continue living in this inhuman condition. 28-year-old Nkole Mangoni, the chairperson of the Economic Commune of South African Shack Brothers Movement, Abaklali Basimo Jandolo, was gunned down at his home in Durban on August 20th. Thank you. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like now to observe a minute of silence for, uh, for him, for all the Abaklali uh, movement leaders recently killed and for the South African human rights defenders murdered while fighting for human rights and justice. Thank you. We can now start our event. My name is uh, Nicola Bakamicha, I'm an advocacy officer at Civicus, Water Alliance for Citizen Participation. Um, I would like to thank you all for being with us today for this event, um, defending land and protecting rights opportunities, opportunities for South Africa UPR. Um, ahead of the upcoming uh, South Africa 4th UPR review, the side event will address the human rights situation in the country, focusing on challenges faced by human rights defenders in the exercise of their rights to land and housing. Uh, the speakers will address the heightened repression against human rights defenders, in particular those working in the field of housing, special justice, and equitable land distribution. We will kick off the event with an introduction from Habitat International Coalition on the codification of the human rights to adequate housing and land. We will then have the Abakhlali Basel Jordor movement focusing on repression and targeted assassination they have endured as advocates for the rights of people living in shacks, including access to decent housing, services, and education. Since the beginning of 2022, three movement leaders based in the Ikanana commune have been murdered within the space of six months. 24 members of the movement have been murdered throughout the country, with little justice being done for the crimes committed. The representative from Axara Restorative Justice, justice Forum will address the battle for heritage and environmental protection for indigenous Sun and Khoi communities in South Africa. He will report on the highly charged and controversial case of the construction of the proposed Amazon African headquarters on historically significant land for the Sun and Khoi communities. The representative of the Southern Africa Human Rights Defenders Network will provide an overview of the legal system in place and the challenges to accessing justice. Finally, the speaker from the Human Rights Institute of South Africa, Yurisa, will contextualize the event within the discussion of these issues during previous UPR sessions and articulate the need to address the pressing and fundamental issues at the upcoming UPR session. We will have three video statements, uh, but if technology uh, supports us, panelists will join us online for the Q&A uh, section. Sorry. Um, I would like to start by giving the floor to Mr. Joseph Shekla, via uh, video statement. 
Joseph is the coordinator at uh, Habitat International Coalition and will provide us with the legal frame, framing of the human rights to adequate housing and land. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Joseph Schechter. I am coordinator of Habitat International Coalition's Housing and Land Rights Network, speaking to you from Cairo. <coughs> Unfortunately, I cannot uh, be with you in person today, but I'm glad to have such excellent colleagues on this panel to share with you the current events and developments in the long struggle for the human right to adequate housing and land in South Africa. And this is an auspicious moment to do so, only a few weeks before the Republic of South Africa undergoes its fourth Universal Periodic Review. As sponsor of this event today, Habitat International Coalition and its social base of some 350 member organizations in over 80 countries extend their deeply felt solidarity with those on the front line of struggle to make good on the promises of the post-apartheid era in South Africa while realizing also that the apartheid model still remains institutionalized also in some other countries such as Israel and Myanmar. Founded in 1976 with the first conference of the UN on housing and human settlements, Habitat One, Habitat International Coalition has since built a body of collective work including international standard setting, advocacy, uh, to advance the related human rights norms to be practiced on the ground. For example, uh, Hick's early engagement with the UN human rights system prioritized the elaboration of a formal definition of the human right to adequate housing, promised in so few well-chosen words in the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, Article 11. Co cooperation with the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights led in 1991 to that legal definition in the committee's general comment number four, the first such general comment dedicated to a particular human right under the covenant. That authoritative instrument uh, recognized that notwithstanding the type of tenure, all persons should possess a degree of security of tenure that guarantees legal protection against forced eviction, harassment, and other threats. Consequently, the committee called for states' parties to take immediate measures aimed at conferring legal security of tenure upon those persons and households currently lacking such protection in genuine consultation with affected persons and groups. At Habitat II in 1996, the Istanbul Declaration and Program of Action committed all states to the progressive realization of the human right to adequate housing, repeating that promise 61 times in a single policy instrument. A year later, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights adopted General Comment Number 7, recognizing the prohibition against the practice of forced eviction by states and third parties. It enshrined legal criteria for lawful eviction that have withstood the test of the ensuing 27 years. Moreover, the Commission on Human Rights also affirmed in 1993 and again reaffirmed in 2004 that forced eviction constitutes a gross violation of human rights, in particular the human right to adequate housing. By 2006, the General Assembly also adopted the reparations framework for the victims of such gross violations of human rights. By now, this council also has received this consistent advice from four successive special rapporteurs on adequate housing throughout the past two decades. Moreover, within the UN development system, the new urban agenda of 2016 has provided specificity to a bundle of SDGs guiding implement implementation of not only those temporary and voluntary commitments in the 2030 Agenda, but also the prior permanent and binding obligations of states to respect, protect, and fulfill human rights. The new Urban Agenda Policy Instrument also commits states to prevent forced eviction, but also repeats their commitment to realize the social function of land 
and commits them to support the social production of housing and habitat, which involves the processes that generate habitable spaces, urban components, and homes carried out under the control of self-producers and other social agents who operate without seeking profit outside the formal market. In the UPR of South Africa, we look for examples of such practice to make good on these commitments and implement the state's obligations arising from the human right to adequate housing. These norms take on existential meaning and importance to Habitat International Coalition which has accompanied all this theoretical standard setting and also today still seeks its implementation. However, by the current example of South Africa, which you are about to hear, we regret the continuing gross violations of human rights and mourn the assassination of four South African housing and land rights defenders this year alone. However, we also organize in solidarity with their communities in the pursuit of just reparations amid the progressive realization of the human right to adequate housing for all. Today, we may conclude that we still have a long, long way to go. Thank you, Joseph. I would like now to, to move, up, move on to Apeli Bonono. He's the deputy president of the Abaklali movement and ex will explain us the heightened repression <coughs> faced by the movement advocating for land and housing rights. Thank you very much, uh, all colleagues and everyone in the room. Uh, thank you very much to improvised communities in South Africa, especially Abaklali Basem general members, to entrust me to carry all their pain all the way from South Africa to here. Uh, my name is Mkapili Bonono. I'm the elected deputy president of Abashali Basem Jondolo, the Sheikh Willis movement in South Africa that was formed in 2005 to struggle an unjust equality society based on respect and dignity. All what we want to see in our mission is to improve the people's lives and the conditions for all humankind who people live in informal settlements to assert the dignity, especially for those that are living in informal settlement and the poor within the country. The main objectives that we really focus on is to struggle for, for land and decent housing and dignity. As we have seen and watched the video uh, of my fellow comrade, my fellow leader, Linda Goshlem Guni, may so rest in peace. I was unable to even don't know where to start when I have to watch him speaking again. After I've just left in the country by touching his body when he was no more. I've seen him lying in a blood been shot 13 times by own by I know men who have came in the settlement and and take his life out. After he got a lot of repression within the state by kept in prison, by getting threat from the ruling party members around that area. But we still continue with the struggle because he has to defend the land of a commune of Ekenana. So thank you so much for everyone to give us a chance to come and hear our story. So that how, how, how are we treated in South Africa? As everybody know that things South Africa has gained freedom, but we are here to testify in front of you that we are still here, there in South Africa living like pigs, people that are treated inhuman, people that are living in these inhuman conditions. If you come to South Africa, people are still dying with floods. Recently, what we are experiencing is the oppression that has been put ahead of us by the members of state, by the members of the ruling party that leading the municipalities in the level. So we have experienced a lot again the unlawful evictions that have been carried out are so brutally 
uh, against our members. We have managed to build the power from below to make sure that women and children, they also have the voice within the democracy that our forefathers they fought for in South Africa. But today with all that, when we fight for our right to have an access to land, we have experienced 24 assassinations of our members. I'm speaking here right today in front of everybody here in Geneva to want to make sure that they must know that members of Abbas and John Dolo, right now while I'm speaking, are still living fear, especially members of Ekenan. They are fearing for, of, of their lives and no one in South Africa that is prepared to assist and defend them, especially those commissions that have been obligated by the Constitution of South Africa. So we are here today. I was, supposed, I was not supposed to be speaking in this platform. Uh, Lindo Gute, he was the one who was supposed to come and present our pain here in Geneva. But unfortunately, in two days just before for him to apply for his visa, he was gone down. Just for defending the land of a community, community of Ekenana. A land where people, they have managed to establish the community in 2018 to make sure that they can be able to, to have their, their lives, to have the access to land, especially those ones that are really in proof, uh, privileged people that are coming from the rural areas to the cities, people that have been denied the right, even the access to live on those cities. So Lindo Bulle, he was in the forefront of defending the land of Ekenana commune. He's been kept at least six months in prison with no evidence, with fabricated charges that have been put for before him, he has resisted that. He has been living without his family, staying in the same homes because of the threats that have been imposed to him. All his colleagues that he was living with them in the commune, in the commune he has experienced to see them lying in the blood before they can kill him. Only this year, just since from March up until today, while I'm speaking here. You already, as a movement, experience four of our members that has been assassinated. Ayanda Ngila, who was a deputy chairperson of a branch of Abashlali, a Kenana commune, was gone down. He did die in the daylight, broad day. Everyone watching, children, women, while he was busy in a Kenana uh, commune garden, busy fixing the pipe, the irrigation pipe, four unknown men and suspected members of the ruling party, particularly ANC at Etiwini, have walked out the commune garden and gunned him down, at least with seven bullets, and they left him dead. On the 12th of March, the face police mask, they've uh, raid a community of Nkanini, also in Ketomena in Deben. They have shot dead Siabonga Mangala and left him. On the 5th of May, again at Ekonena commune, we have experienced another assassination of a woman of Noktula Mabaso, who was gunned down while she was walking out at the Franz Fanon School, a community hall, where they had a meeting and then she just walked home. When she walked back to the meeting, two unknown men, also suspected members of the ruling party that have been kept in custody, right while I'm speaking, have taken her life away. And again, today we have to try all means to, to engage a various department, especially the Minister of Police, Mr. Begitale. He has denied the right for us to justice. We've made a lot of intervention because we have seen this data is coming. He decided not to protect us. Today we are speaking of Lindo Goshem Guni that he also left. Also, we are still been seeking a justice on him because no one has been arrested of his matter. So we are here before you to speak about the repression of the movement that we are gaining, to sing solidarity whoever who can stand up for this right and ask questions. What is wrong to us when we are fighting for? What is right for us to have in housing? What is wrong for us when we are fighting to have an access to land? 
What is wrong for us when we are fighting for just any basic services? Because these communities, these are people that are still denied even water and electricity. People that are still live, when these shake fires start, there are people that cry and no one comes and assists them because they don't even have water even to, to be able to enable to put those fires off. So we are here today to pledge a support because while I'm speaking right now in Kenana, when we left our comrade, our comrade, people are living in fear, comrades are still living in a safe house. We really need a special request to everyone who can support the movement by ensuring that we don't continue to experience more of these killings. And we also pledge the members to give questions, especially to the UN Council, to call the South African government to give an investigation of inquiry of all these killings that have been happening within the country of human rights defenders. So we thank you all for coming here. We hope we can be able to to share our experiences even outside this, this room here. But all we want is justice. All we want is to be given an access to South Africa that we can be able to have land and we can be able to have food and we can be able to have a justice when we have been thrown these fabricated charges against us. I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Simpiwe. Simpiwe Sidu is the regional legal advisor for the Southern Africa Human Rights Defenders Network and she will explain us the legal framework on land and housing in South Africa and challenges to, to access to justice. Um, thank you very much Nicola. So I'll just um, take you briefly take you through the, the legal framework that we currently have in South Africa on um, land and housing rights and just also an update on what is happening and maybe perhaps look at the best way forward in terms of this challenge that we are increasingly seeing in our country, um, especially within the context of the rising inequalities. Um, so, you know, as we, we, we are all um, aware that, you know, just during apartheid, when we just also look at where South Africa is right now, we also just have to look at the legacy um, of apartheid that has like um, badly impacted us. Um, in terms of the land redistribution um, question for the majority of uh, the population in the country which uh, consists of black people. And when we also just look at the 1913 Natives Act, I think you know that's where just some of the issues as well started in the country where thousands of uh, non-white um, people in South Africa as well were just forcibly removed from their homes and they were also just prevented from also owning land under the apartheid um, government. And so what happened was when South Africa officially um, became an, an apartheid um, state uh, was that many people were also just restricted in terms of where they live according to their race. And I think this is something that we actually see right now with the townships that we have as well in the country. That it is where many are just um, overpopulated as well. And we also saw an increase as well of like uh, backyard dwellers where you find three different families just living in, uh, in, a, in a single yard um, because of this issue that we experienced in the country due to um, the, the arbitrary laws that discriminated on people on the basis of their race. And when we uh, finally um, got into a democracy in 1994, um, our constitution, um, we first, you know, obviously had an interim constitution in 1996 was the one that was um, finally adopted. And the Constitution um, recognized quite a number of Bill of Rights, including the right to land and the right to housing as well. Um, so in terms of the right to land, um, it allows for a framework for land reform um, on the basis of protection of property rights and expropriation only where it is in the public interest. And um, there were three key elements of, um, that were identified in terms of the legislative policies as well that the government had adopted since then. So we do have quite a number of um, legislation in the country um, that seeks to um, redress um, the issues that we had in the past as well. Uh, but I will not focus on all of them uh, because of the limited time that we have. But I think just something to note that uh, we also adopted something called the National Development Plan, which was an objective that the government sought to achieve, like fully achieve by 2030. Uh, so what the NDP does is that it recognizes that um, it uh, wanted to 
um, ratify the issue of uh, this land reform and through restitution, redistribution, internal reform as well. Uh, but according to the statistics that we have, we are yet to achieve uh, the NDP objectives. And I don't think that even 2030 South Africa would have just fully um, achieved those objectives by breaking down apartheid, special pre uh, planning geography, and just even the, the land reform issue that we continuously see um, in the country. And so civil society has had to, with the, with the increasing also failures of you know, the, the government as well, not being able perhaps to implement these policies um, holistically and achieve these objectives. Um, civil society as well has also been forced to rely on courts um, just as a way to also make sure that the policies are rightfully implemented and the rights of people are also protected. Because even when we entered into, into a democracy, we still saw an increased level of unlawful evictions taking place and we also just needed to know within the context of the constitution what really does constitute an unlawful eviction, um, how can a person obtain land, and so forth. And I think the Constitutional Court of South Africa has certainly done a great job in terms of protecting social economic rights. These include um, issues concerning water rights or even land and property rights. And when it comes to um, property rights, the Constitutional Court has passed quite a number of judgments that also declared the unlawful eviction um, on both private, um, private property and even uh, public property, and where the state has also just been um, forced to ensure that it provides uh, people, especially poor people, with alternative accommodation, and it shouldn't um, evict people without uh, not being able to find them any alternative shelter. And even with that alternative shelter, it has to also just be adequate um, and comply with the standards of also providing people with access to water and other basic services that are important for for their for their living. And so, um, even though that was a success from the part of the judiciary, obviously there's always that challenge that comes with the other um, arms of government not complying with the court orders and some of the um, and. What the legislature also proposed to do actually in 2018 as well, when they were seeing that they are also um, struggling to fulfill this um, land issue in South Africa, was that there was a proposed amendment to Section 25 of our Constitution, because it only right now it only provides for a willing buyer, willing seller agreement, which I think 5%, we've had like a 5% success, uh, but majority of the land is obviously still owned by the minority in the country. And so when the 2018, um, amendment was proposed before the National Assembly. It was rejected as well, actually. So it was 204 lawmakers that backed the amendment, which obviously consisted of the majority ruling party. And then 145 uh, members of parliament also rejected it. So right now, the constitution has not been, amendment, uh, has not been amended according to just the proposal that the ANC had also put forward. Uh, but I would just like to also maybe draw to your attention also just one of the positions that were made by Abashali Basem John Dono when um, you know, the, the government was also accepting public comments on this issue. And so Abashali had made the recommendation that um, land, should not be, land should be seen as a public good and not as a private property and as a commodity. So land should be made a right and not a form of property. And it also rejected the proposition that land must be owned by the state because I think it's clear from even when we entered into a democracy that there's increasing corruption by the state, which also results in the killing of people who try to expose um, such corruption. And so some of the efforts that are also being made right now by civil society is that there was a matter that was recently heard by the Constitutional Court where the government, where um, um, Seri was just trying to ask the court to actually enact, uh, to recognize that maybe we should, should have constitutional damages for instances where the, the government fails to fulfill um, economic and social and cultural rights. So where people have been waiting for land or property to be given for, for more than 20 years, perhaps we should have um, constitutional damages being able to be like, claimed from the government um, in that instance. But unfortunately, the Constitutional Court rejected um, that proposal that was uh, made by Seri. So right now, they have started with a new application before the High Court. Uh, the matter is yet to be heard before the, the High Court. But one of the things that uh, Seri will seek to um, actually raise 
in this High Court matter is just what is the meaning of appropriate relief in terms of Section 38 of the Constitution, and can we certainly um, extend that to social um, social economic uh, rights? Because with the increasing inequalities and the failure of the government to fulfil its duties, perhaps we should look at other measures or other mechanisms to try and force them um, to be able to just fulfil their mandates. I'll just stop there for for now, and then if there's enough time later, I'll I'll just touch more on the topic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Simpiwe. Uh, next, we have a video statement by Mr. Tulik Jenkins, Chair at Axara Restorative Justice Forum. Uh, Tulik will focus on strategic lawsuits against public participation, a tactic more and more used in South Africa to silence land and environmental defenders. It's called the observed distinguished leadership, uh, honorable friends, colleagues, and comrades. Good morning. My name is Tori Jenkins. I'm the chairperson of the Tyra Restorative Justice Forum based at the Center for African Studies at the University of Cape Town. I also speak to you as a High Commissioner of the Gori Naikona Koiko Tradition Indigenous Council, who has power of attorney of 22 Sana and Koi groups that have entered into litigation against the Western Cape government, the city of Cape Town, and the private developer called Jews to Treasure Property Trust, contesting a land which is considered of uh, extraordinary significance to uh, first indigenous communities, land which holds intangible and tangible heritage resources. It is a sensitive um, riverine system, a floodplain, which currently is being threatened by 150,000 square meters of concrete bulk and uh, desecration uh, environmentally, as well as a permanent threat to its extraordinary heritage resources for the purposes of building an Amazon.com headquarters on this particular terrain. The particular terrain that we are talking about, which is contested, is one that is earmarked as a epicenter of liberation and resistance. It is where the first wars of liberation were fought, first against the Portuguese on the 1st of March 1510. It is where land was stolen for the very first time by the Dutch East India Company, who had gifted this land to its freeburgers, its employees, in 1657 using Roman Dutch law and trying to teach to justify indigenous land theft. It is from this terrain too that the colonizer Jan van Ribbeck put up a dividing hedge, palisaded fence that moved across all along a sacred river called the Lisbeth. Once this fence had been put up, it became a frontier zone. And because the Khoi Khoi were fighting against the occupation by the Dutch at that time, whose Intrusion was expanding on either side of the Lisbeth <coughs> The war broke out. <coughs> this war, which broke out in 1559, was the start of the first quote, Dutch frontier war, which precipitated over a 200 year period of wars of liberation and resistance, and whose consequences saw human beings fanned out across southern Africa in exile, <coughs> running away from massacre and unfortunately it resulted in the today's a still unrecognized genocide of the cancer and the fact that many indigenous animals were can hunted to extinction yet in spite of these heritage acknowledgements amazon.com has forged ahead with concrete blocks and bulldozers together with the pleasure property trust which is the private developer that this 14.8 hectare piece of land belongs to, and it is part of a broader sensitive area called the Tours of the Urban Park, which is already protected by a number of environmental policies, that the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape government have allowed for the destruction of this floodplain in order to accommodate Amazon.com's headquarters. It is a place that also marks the history of entanglement between oppressor and oppressed, and it is why that this particular precinct has been nominated and earmarked for a very necessary Truth and Reconciliation Commission for the San and Khoi, which will deal with issues around land disposition, genocide, ethnocide, linguicide, forced removals, loss of culture, and the fact that the dissenting communities of the San and Khoi today are relegated in the concrete jungles of the Cape Flats, who have been divorced from the indigenous language, which 
hundreds of years ago was made illegal. And those who wanted to speak the language were subjected to very brutal forms of colonial punishment, such as the removal of front teeth to prevent the clicking. So what we have seen since 2021, when we started litigation against the development, and just for the context of everybody present, we have been fighting against the proposals of this development since the end of 2017, 20, and when the Western Cape government, the city of Cape Town, and the developer refused to acknowledge the fact that the, the proposal was completely inappropriate, both in terms of scale and also in terms of its location. Um, once the approvals and green lights were given for the rezoning plus an approval of the environmental assessment, despite the fact that the city's own environmental department had rejected the environmental assessment, despite the fact that the provincial government's own heritage authority rejected the heritage assessments that came in by the developer, um, these were both approved by political courts. So we have entered into litigation, and thus far, the High Courts have stood strong in terms of holding up our arguments against the development. Deputy President Judge Goliath issued a groundbreaking precedent decision that stated that the will of indigenous communities, that their consent, and that what they hold sacred cannot be trumped by the economic factor. Today we are sitting with about 10 cases in court. Her verdict had been challenged by four different Supreme Court of Appeals. Human rights defenders, as well as leadership within the traditional structures and civic structures, have been subject to, to smear, to vitriolic, slander campaigns, to physical threats, and an environment of massive safety concerns has now become the norm. This uh, kind of intimidation is not alien to people who wish to speak truth to power, but it has become of major concern to all of us that the divide and conquer mechanisms that are also being deployed are seeing Koya groups and African groups fight against one another as the developer <coughs> has needed to accrue a bastion of indigenous people to support their claims. Today, on behalf of the Gori Nakona and of many of the Tram traditional sound and Koya houses who are with us in court in a ferocious uh, battle of litigation, we asked for your support and we asked for the right kind of diplomatic pressure to be put on our government and to be put on the city of Cape Town and the Western Cape government to immediately stop what is a serious act of heritage crime, of heritage criminal behavior, of the desecration of something that is sacred to all South Africans, and to investigate how is it possible that a multinational corporation like Amazon is allowed to infringe these kinds of laws locally and also internationally in as far as the Paris Agreement is concerned in relation to climate change mitigation. And just to conclude, that until the Sun and Koi are placed in the center of the discussion, the idea of an African Renaissance will always remain the nascent stage. On behalf of uh, the Pirates of the Justice Forum, the Leadership Action Campaign, the Sun and Koi communities that are against this particular development, I'd like to say thank you very much. I you could taking that. Thank you. Um, as the last speaker of today's event, we have Colette Littlejohn. Colette is the executive director at Hurisa, and she will focus on previous recommendations to land and housing, their lack of implementation, and uh, the upcoming DPR. Uh, Roger Rita. Uh, firstly, I would like to express uh, my thanks and uh, uh, gratitude uh, for being provided uh, this opportunity to be 
one of the panelists here on this site event uh, that is uh, addressing the situation of human rights, particularly uh, looking at challenges facing human rights defenders uh, that protect lives and then also that um, you know advocate for the protection of the exercise of this right. And also just to mention that um, in South Africa has collected 247 uh, recommendations during its third uh, UPR second. And uh, ULISA it was one of the uh, civil society organizations that uh, advocated for some of the pertinent recommendations uh, that uh, you know consist on uh, uh, economic social rights, uh, civil and political rights, environmental rights, gender-based violence, and uh, you know sexual minority as well as uh, persons with albinism and uh, uh, you know uh, uh, various groups uh, that uh, uh, you know rights have been uh, reported to have been grossly uh, violated. And uh, regarding the land rights and housing, uh, I must say that uh, it is very unfortunate that South Africa is a country that emerges from a brutal apartheid when land and housing was regulated by a, you know, very uh, segregated policies that discriminated upon persons, but African people or black people uh, based on their color because uh, during apartheid era, uh, black people had no right to land ownership. Occupation of land was regulated by apartheid policies that you know, you know, demarcated people or segregated people, and uh, people were, uh, you know, you know, uh, were entitled to lease. There were different forms of policies that were regulating the movement and the uh, occupation of, of property. And uh, so uh, it is there only after the advent of democracy that uh, the government, um, you know, began, uh, you, know, you know, putting all these rights that in our Bill of Rights, legislations is there promoting uh, land distribution. However, I must say that a progress has really been very, very slow. Uh, to the fact that um, uh, you know um, where you know a recommendation was passed on South Africa uh, to uh, encourage the government to optimize land distribution and um, also uh, ensure that the land reforms you know provide support adequate support and training to beneficiaries and ensuring that there's close consultation with all the stakeholders. All the stakeholders means, you know, disadvantaged communities, previously marginalized communities. They will be consulted uh, for any land reform or development that the government uh, is putting forward. We have seen that, uh, you know, what is really um, uh, growing in South Africa is, uh, you know, fear that has been instilled that, uh, you know, a restrict freedom of expression and participation uh, in, 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 in land distribution or in, 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 in you know, advocating for, for, for the right to land or to housing. And uh, we have seen that uh, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, restrictions that are uh, you know uh, coming uh, not in policy but in some practices that are very arbitrary uh, to persons that occupy it, especially within the the mining uh, communities where there's uh, you know, extractive corporations that are coming into South Africa to uh, you know uh, do mining. We've seen that in these communities, this is where extrajudicial killings, you know, have happened for many years without proper investigations. 
we have seen that um, uh, you know uh, you know these uh, defenders are being targeted. Uh, there's uh, arbitrary arrest. There's um, you know there's uh, you know a fear you know uh, to speak or to engage in communities. There's harassment. Uh, for, for people to even raise these issues around climate change. Uh, uh, you know, regarding the, the, the extractive industry, a recommendation was passed, you know, uh, that South Africa must ensure that they develop laws uh, that compels or that rules uh, the, the mining companies uh, or extractive industry accountable for provision, for some so, you know, contributing or supporting, uh, well, uh, you know, housing uh, programs. For example, the mining communities they have, you know, uh, you know, undertaken a, a contract whereby there has been a commitment that they will be, you know, contributing to social, economic, and development in communities. That has not uh, taken taken effect, you know, to the to the to the to the, to the minimum. Uh, you know, expectation. Uh, we have seen that uh, the government has uh, has uh, actually uh, done little uh, to promote the right to land, to promote the right to housing, and to really uh, uh, you know condemn uh, human rights violations that target uh, you know uh, human rights uh, and defenders. Uh, we understand the with regard to Abashari Basin Jondolo, which is a, a community that has, uh, you know, uh, experienced these um, assassinations, mysterious killings uh, that have led many of their leaders, you know, uh, executed. And this made us, you know, uh, happen in a very brutal manner that, uh, you know, undermine the institutional rights to life, the right to life is a non derogable right. It is a right that the government, uh, you know, has a duty uh, to protect and to ensure that uh, it's, uh, it's it's promoted at, at, at in communities and ensuring that you know uh, uh, companies uh, that are coming in to extract uh, minerals uh, they comply with the law and respect domestic domestic laws uh, you know we we know that uh, the, the, there was a recommendation that was specifically passed on South Africa that uh, it needs to make progress uh, in providing uh, adequate housing and have programs such as integrated uh, human settlement grant and urban settlement development grant and uh, also it was required to continue making efforts to ensure that uh, the household and even the uh, schools, you know, in, in communities as well as at health facilities are conducive and are made accessible, as well as community, uh, you know, have a safe water and sanitation. Now, these are the rights that continue to be violated, and defenders of this right are being targeted. Uh, you know, despite that uh, five years ago, such strong recommendations have been given on South Africa uh, to promote this right. The government has done little in ensuring that, uh, you know, all citizens in the country enjoy their rights and access to housing and land, you know, is realized in a fair and equitable manner. We are recommending uh, for the government uh, to ensure that uh, these extrajudicial killings and the persecutions, harassment, and intimidation, and the arbitrary arrest, you know, of of, of, of uh, land rights uh, defenders and housing in South Africa, you know, are condemned, and the prosecution of the perpetrators of this right. Uh, we know that uh, some some of these uh, suspects were arrested. Some of them have been um, convicted uh, with, 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 with uh, heavy sentences. However, we know there are others uh, where government has not made any progress 
and we, we want the government to really uh, improve this and, and uh, you know, speed up, you know, the prosecutions of all those that have been uh, murdered uh, for, for, for exercising this right uh, of, of, of land and, and, and housing, uh, ensuring that communities live without fear and uh, enjoy the freedom of expression and association uh, without fear of the prize house. I thank you very much. Thank you, Colette. We only have a few minutes left. We would have loved to receive your questions. But I would like to go back to St. Way for uh, some recommendations. Uh, thank you very much, Nicola. I think it's very evident from the discussions that we are having that um, if we continue to fail to address the land issue or the pressing social economic rights in South Africa, we will continue to see the increasing attacks against human rights defenders and civic space. And so I think it is just a recommendation that it is very important for um, the South African government to just revisit what actually um, the land and actually housing issue would holistically mean when it comes to addressing um, the rights for everyone and not leaving anyone behind. And that certainly does include taking into account factors like the land not being um, left at the position of the state because it has been clear as well in the past several years that there cannot be any trust from the state as well. And so how do we actually just holistically address it and make sure that it is a public good that can benefit everyone and that people can collectively own um, in terms of if you look at the community in Ekenana as well. I think it's just one of the best practices that um, we are, are seeing that if we allow people to just fully express or themselves on that land that they occupy. It does assist in fulfilling other rights, such as the rights to food, um, and just also the right to shelter uh, for themselves. So thank you very much. Thank you, CP. I'd just would like to thank all the organizations who sponsored the event, and I would like to conclude by saying that uh, throughout the presentations, we have heard cases of impunity, unlawful evictions, uh, police brutality, slaps, xenophobia, judicial killings, lack of access to basic services and lack of engagement with community members. Uh, all these violations are especially perpetrated against human rights defenders and community leaders fighting for their fundamental socioeconomic rights and hence human dignity. In the 2018 report, the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights made important recommendations on land and housing. To date, these recommendations have not yet been implemented and the situation of human rights continues to deteriorate as a result of the denial of access to land and housing. Um, violations around economic, social and cultural rights will not be addressed until South Africa addresses, addresses the root causes of the redistribution of land. We call on states to use the opportunity provided by the upcoming UPR to raise questions and recommendations to, to South Africa on these issues. Thank you again for, for participating in this event. Thank you.